Then comes the antithesis. The antithesis, which is the second side of the coin, namely the human factor, which to us, being in education, should be of some concern, possibly more than concern for administrators and people with their hands on their on, on the money pocket. I'd like to make a few points about higher education and teacher education with respect to distance learning. And that is, let me remind you, the antithesis to what I've said before. The first point is that teacher education is a meeting place of generations, traditions, and cultures. It's not just teacher training. It's nurse training and doctor training and sociologists and biologists and mathematicians and what have you. The one of the few places where a young person meets a grown-up, an adult, who is not his father, and can inspire him without having a little revolution of independence. <laughs> that is where people from the south meet people from the north, where green people meet yellow people, where people meet other individuals they've never met before in the neighborhood. You don't get it through distance learning. <laughs> Second point, <coughs> the point I made yesterday, I will not elaborate on it since I spoke about it yesterday in some detail, namely that the accessible information, that which comes through the pipes, is not knowledge. And that's a distinction I've, I'm making and I'm, I've, I try to emphasize it. Information is not knowledge and what we can transmit through distance learning, through all kinds of other electronic means, whatever we choose, it's always only information. The knowledge is something that the individual at the other side has to construct on his or her own. And as I've said yesterday, information and knowledge are not the same. Here's a saying by somebody, you can't read it there, never mind, a sociologist, seduced by the effortless access to information, we are discounting the need and the cost of turning information into knowledge and knowledge into wisdom. So when administrators tell us that it is much cheaper to have distance learning, distance education, they are right. They only ignore or disregard the cost of turning information into knowledge. Over breakfast I described a brief story about the administrators. I have nothing, by the way, against administrators. Don't get me wrong. I want to say even my mother was wrong. She administered my life until I grew up. <laughs> they, the administrators wanted to save money and they sent uh, a committee to check out the Philharmonic Orchestra. And they came to, uh, to look at the orchestra performing Beethoven's Ninth. They were deeply impressed but wrote the following report. That it's very funny. They have both violas and violins. Not only this, they have quite a number of each. <laughs> Which is wasteful. And then if you listen to the music, there's a lot of repetition there. <laughs> Can be reduced. And indeed, they reduce the orchestra to six players and seven minutes. <laughs> Which saved a lot of money. <laughs> The third point is that teacher education serves more than the transmission of knowledge. And here I'd like to elaborate on it a little bit. Let us even say that if we have good interaction and tutorship through the web or what have you, we help our students translate or transform information into knowledge. And that's, we've taken care of that. However, and I want to argue, this is really not all there is in teacher education. First of all, there is something called skill. 
And there are numerous skills. From the skill, if you're one of conducting research, planning research, generating an hypothesis, formulating a good question, to the simple skill of standing in front of a classroom. And let me remind you what that is. If you're an elementary school teacher, you stand in front of 20 or 30 kids who are about to shoot you dead <laughs> with their running noses. And you have to survive it. Six hours a day or so. Drilling for oil is nothing in comparison. <laughs> Little wonder that we have such a high attrition. I'm serious. And such a high rate of burnout among nurses, social workers, and teachers. And one of the things, not the only one, that helps a teacher survive in that belligerent, warlike environment is the skill of a teacher. Have you ever tried to teach tennis or skiing by correspondence? <laughs> But the same applies to standing in front of a classroom. Or we say, teaching is also the art of acting. Yes, I know, I got it from my daughter. Like craziness. Parents inherit such things from their children. <laughs> yeah, teaching has something like acting. There's so many skills involved. The what a time, it began at Stanford when they tried the micro-teaching system to reduce all of teaching to very specific skills which you learn. Smile. Ask analytic <coughs> questions. Listen. You know, a chain of these skills. That was, of course, making a little bit, how would I say, re reduction ad absurdum of the teaching skills. But obviously, skills are involved. And you cannot seriously <coughs> teach them by distance learning, in my opinion. The second is a little bit more complicated, meta-knowledge. Meta-knowledge is knowledge about mathematics, biology, history. It's not enough to know a little mathematics through three rules of overlapping <coughs> triangles. And what's the difference between a triangle and a, and a pair of jeans? There is deeper knowledge about what is the logic of mathematics or what is the logic of biology. What are the rules of science in each of these disciplines? And they are called disciplines for good reason. There is a method there. And the method of history is not the same as the method of biology. So that is really meta-knowledge and the good teacher doesn't only know mathematics. The good teacher understands what mathematics is all about. By the way, what is it about? I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> and the third, dispositions. <clears throat> being a scholar, being a professional, being a teacher, includes certain dispositions, tendencies, proclivities, a disposition to be curious, a disposition to be empathic. <coughs> a disposition to be supportive, sometimes to be skeptical. There are so many, <coughs> so many dispositions involved here. None of them can be really transmitted through distance learning. So says the antithesis. <laughs> My fourth point. Teacher education is not a matter of the loneliness of the long distance learner or the long distance teacher. And that's a point I mentioned yesterday, I will not elaborate. Namely, really learning and teaching is a matter of a community. <coughs> and, and let me say something about it. <coughs> Possibly the last profession on earth 
in which an individual enters a room, closes a door, and faces the enemy on an, on, all on his own or her own. is teaching. No other profession that this exists. The physician has colleagues with whom he or she can consult. The lawyer doesn't work alone. There are other lawyers with whom he and she talks about the case. Architects don't work alone, etc., etc., except for that one profession, uh, the archaeological leftover of the days of the solo performer. And we know it is changing because if we today celebrate teamwork, collaborative learning, cooperative learning, etc., this is true not only of the learner, this is true of the teacher trainee, and it is true of teachers. Teaching has become a far more demanding job, a far more demanding profession today. And all over you see networks of teachers springing up in which teachers can discuss with each other the questions of teaching, of discipline, of youth violence, of how do I finally make them understand the quadratic equation? I myself don't really understand it yet. <laughs> it is certainly not a matter of the solo learner or solo teacher. And it is a matter, as we have mentioned it yesterday, a matter of face-to-face -face tutorship. Yet another point, I mentioned it briefly yesterday. <coughs> Teacher education, like all other trades, all other professions, it needs a locomotive to lead it. You need a standard, you need a model, you need the perfect example to lead you. You or me. That means that you need the Harvard. You need an Oxford. You need a Stort. <laughs> These are the words, very important words, of uh, Gerard Kasper. He used to be the president of Stanford University. A society that itself wants to be at the frontier of discovery and intellectual vibrancy will not easily get there or remain there <coughs> if it abandons institutions dedicated to the recognition and challenging and thereby the nutrition of excellence. The beauty of distance learning is its democratization. It equalizes everything. The flip side of it is you lose to a large extent the example of the model the standard of excellence, that which is better than the others, serves as a locom locomotive to pull the train of excellence. <coughs>